Hello and welcome to GameSack. In this episode, we are talking about frustrating games. Yes, we are, but we're, we're not saying that every game we're talking about is a bad game. So calm down, don't type up that manifesto because some of these games, a lot of them actually are, are good. I yeah, think. I like a lot of the games we actually talk about today, but there is one that I know for sure is really bad. Actually, probably more than one, Dave, but still we all have our own opinions and that's okay. Anyway, the first game up is, I had actually never left Japan, it's called Steam Gear Mash for the Saturn. Steam Gear Mash is a really fun game for the Japanese Saturn. It's an isometric action game where you got around a robot in his quest to find a little boy who was kidnapped by aliens that fell in love with him. Ah, that sounds so adorable. The game is colorful and bouncy at first, and overall the game leaves you with a great first impression. You acquire new weapons and new methods of shooting to help you get further. The graphics are well done, and the music gets your energy level up as well. But this game is pretty tough to figure out. Everything is in Japanese since it never came out in English. I'm just not sure what to do or where to go in order to proceed, and the confusing level design doesn't help very much either. What's even more frustrating is that your character is so big and it's very hard for him to avoid taking hits and also very hard to hit enemies with your weapons. I blame the isometric perspective for this and it's very hard to judge where things are. You know, I really like that annoying alarm when you get low on life. Yeah, and they don't give you much to start out with and you also only get one life. I want to experience and enjoy all of the fun things that this game has to offer, but even after repeated tries, I still can't quite figure out what I'm supposed to do. I know that different colored boxes require different weapons to destroy, and I guess I just can't find what I need. I think if I could just force myself to practice a little more, this would be fairly enjoyable. Maybe I need a little help from the internet, but to be quite honest, I've always sucked at isometric games. Well, Joe, I've got the perfectly frustrating isometric game for you. It's Solstice for the NES. It's a fun game for the NES, but damn is it frustrating. Throughout the game, you must solve puzzles with an isometric view. This is where it gets frustrating. On this angle, it's very hard to tell where platforms are in relation to the ground and in relation to your character. You might think you're standing right in front of a platform, but lo and behold, you're not. And when you try to make a jump to the platform, you fail and this can result in death. This sucks because you don't get an unlimited supply of lives or continues. Generally though, the control over your character is great. Great control with tricky death perception? Sounds like they did it this way on purpose. They may have. The game, for its time, is good looking and I like the color scheme. I like the music even though it's repetitive, it still fits the game. Now here's Equinox for the Super NES, it's the sequel to Solstice. It's the same isometric style of game with much prettier graphics and detailed environments and enemies. Even though everything looks much better, the isometric view can still be very deceiving. I mean, look at this purple ball. To me, it looks like it's resting on top of this spike. So I try and get it and guess what? I die. Again and again and again. But what's this? It's not on top of the spike, it's resting on the ground in the square catty corner to the spike. Very frustrating indeed. I think most isometric games take pleasure in tricking you into thinking something's where it's not, at least on a few occasions, you know? <laughs> I found that out, that's for sure. Again, both of these games are fairly entertaining. It's just going to take a lot of trial and error to get through the game. A lot of deaths could be avoided if you could tell exact placement of platforms and such. <laughs> Shining Wisdom for the Saturn is a game that tries to play similar to Zelda. Let them all try. It's nearly impossible to beat a good Zelda game. It was made by Camelot, formerly known as Sonic Software Planning, though the manual states that it was made by Sonic Team, which it's not. It was brought over to the US by Working Designs. It belongs in the Shining family of games, which have some great entries like these fine gems. However, this is probably the worst Shining game ever made. It's no wonder Sega didn't want to bring it over themselves. It's an overhead action RPG and the game is very, very tough. You need to build up your walking speed by repeatedly tapping the B button. 
Your sword has an incredibly short reach, almost to the point of ridiculousness, and it makes enemies very tough to hit, but they seem to swarm around you like crazy. You also can't equip your sword and one of your ability boots at the same time. It's, it's just absurd. Yeah, I know. This game's almost as fun as someone shining a bright light in your eyes, isn't it? Almost. Despite it being the worst shining game, it does still look like it has a lot of potential. The graphics are pretty good, but the sprites are all pre-rendered like Donkey Kong Country, and they don't even look that good, mainly due to the super thick black outlines. The music is decent, and it's certainly nothing to complain about. The characters seem well written from what I can see of the game anyway. Perhaps the best thing about this game is it allows you to select from either semi-automatic or manual transmission. What other action RPG lets you do that? Power Strike on the Sega Master System is probably going to piss most people off. It's a shooter, so it's automatically frustrating for me. God, why do I suck at these games? See? I'm totally frustrated right now. Oh, come on, Dave. It's also fairly awesome. It's a vertical shoot-em-up, and it's called a least or a less day or something like that in Japan. This is, more or less, a version of the first game in that series. You could only get it via mail order in the US, and it came in a black and white box. I kind of messed with my box, and now it's rather tacky, but hey, I was a dumb teenager, so what did I know? Anyway, the game gets harder the better you play. That doesn't sound fun. It actually sounds like the Tetris formula, but I love Tetris. Not this, though. Well, I love it. That's why I scream at it. Things can get really insane really fast, and the game does its best to make sure your life is miserable. You collect different weapons based on numbers. Each number is, of course, a different weapon. Number 8 is the best weapon, and the game knows this, and that's why you rarely see an 8. Oh, there's one! Must get it! Oh, crap! Ah, oh, got it! Unfortunately, these weapons are timed, and they don't last more than a couple of minutes, then it's back to weapon number one. Your regular shot can be powered up with the little yellow P icons, and they stay powered up until you die. Overall, the graphics are pretty nice, and the music is fantastic. But I've only ever made it up to stage four or so, as this game is extremely punishing. There's lots of slowdown here, and I actually think it kind of helps out. But still, be sure to keep valuable objects out of reach when playing this game. Ghosts and Goblins was one of my favorite NES games growing up. Back in that time, I could actually almost beat this game. But, just like others in the series, to truly beat it, you must play through it twice. The graphics in the game are a mixed bag. Some areas and enemies are good looking while others are not. The music is outstanding. Outstanding? Really? I mean, it's good and all, but it's not on the level of Mega Man or anything. Well, Joe, I love almost the whole soundtrack, and nothing else could match the game better. Okay, no problem, I agree. Calm down. Thank you. Now, on to the frustrating parts. Firstly, the control of Arthur is mostly good. He does have some mechanics that could have used refinement. Ladders are the first thing that come to mind. There are times that no matter how hard you try, you cannot get off or on a ladder. I hate that. It's uncanny. The difficulty of the game is insane. The regenerating enemies and the amounts of enemies can be overwhelming at times. Coupled with no control over your character while jumping makes this even harder. Oh, how many times I wished Arthur could shoot upwards. Still though, it's a fun game, but I know deep inside that I will never be able to beat this game. I still play it from time to time just because I'm a masochist in that sense. Keep trying, Dave. You can do it. Oh, thanks, Joe. Say, Dave, didn't we cover Ghosts and Goblins in a previous episode? We sure did, Joe. It was actually episode number 24. Uh, four games with superior sequels. Oh, yeah, I remember now. Yeah. Uh, even though I talked about it then, doesn't mean I can't talk about it again, you know? Yeah, very, very true. You know, perhaps I should have talked more about Shenmue in the Dreamcast episode, actually. Uh, nah, you know, I'm pretty sure you've talked enough about Shenmue. Yeah, you know, uh, maybe you're right, but I don't know. then again, maybe I should have... All right, it. well, uh, let's get back to the episode and talk about games that make you want to strangle somebody. Here 
Here we have Batman Returns on the Sega CD. This game combines the platforming elements from the Batman Returns cartridge game on the Genesis and the all-new driving levels unique to the Sega CD version. Let's look at the platform segments first. Right away you'll notice that the graphics look very dark and dirty. The second thing you'll notice as you're playing is how bad the controls are. Collision detection is a problem and every enemy seems to have a further reach than you do. Everything seems so stiff and unresponsive. The music is great, but it doesn't make up for everything else. This is very frustrating because the difficulty is quite high in these segments and you almost want to pull your hair out with how easily you get hit. You can just tell it was made by people who aren't very familiar with video games because they clearly never played Sunsoft's superior Batman game which preceded this. The designer should feel ashamed for making this. Thank God you can turn the platform levels off. The driving segments are full of awesome. The Sega CD uses its scaling and rotation abilities to do things that the Super Nintendo and even the Neo Geo couldn't dream of doing. I have to agree with you, Joe. The graphics are quite appealing to the eye. Yep, and the game plays very well, too. Your object is usually to blow up a certain number of bad guys before the timer runs out. But this mode can also be quite punishing because it's easy to take damage and the timer doesn't help either. It's very difficult and only the most dedicated will see the upper levels. John O'Brien did a wonderful job with the 3D engine in the game, but he really doesn't seem to know anything about balance or difficulty curves. It really will test your patience and it often seems unfair, but it really is worth it if you put in the effort. The game is awesome, I just wish it were a touch more friendly. Definitely a must own though, and the music is fantastic. This was followed up with The Adventures of Batman and Robin, also for the Sega CD. Basically, you fight all of your enemies in the Batmobile or the Batwing. I guess they thought Batman Returns was too easy, so they made this game. This one has a very steep difficulty curve. The first stage of the game is spent simply trying to avoid tight civilian traffic against a very conservative timer. It's almost as exciting as driving in real life. You eventually get to fight bosses and other enemies. The gameplay isn't exactly as thought out as it should be, though. No kidding. How about the second part where Poison Ivy plants trees in the middle of the street? Those are incredibly tough to avoid. Yep. Even after you've mastered the controls, the game is very unforgiving to the point in making you want to snap the CD in half. It just doesn't give you enough room or time to avoid the collisions in this game and it's very infuriating. It's really too bad too as the graphics are amazing. Some of the objects even appear to be in full 3D. It's really quite a sight to see. However, you won't be able to enjoy the visuals very much because you've got to focus like a hawk on exactly what you're doing in order to get anywhere. The music is quite good. I really enjoyed a lot of the tracks in this game, even though they are kind of short. Between the Levels is an exclusive episode of the Batman cartoon. It looks grainy, but it's pretty cool. The game is fairly short, however, and it uses extreme difficulty to compensate for that. Mutant League Hockey on the Genesis is a game that I thought I would like. I was a fan of NHL 94, and I really like the theme of mutants and crazy ice arenas. Yeah, not to mention Mutant League Football turned out to be pretty good. The graphics in Mutant League Hockey are good, and I really like the different arenas. They just look like different colors to me. Well, look harder, damn it. The players in teams are all entertaining. So why is this game frustrating then? Well, because it was a rush job and it's broken on so many levels. You'd have thought that they had just modified the graphics in an NHL game and just add some better fighting, but I guess not. Playing a game of Mutant League Hockey is almost like having no control over the game and you are just skating around the rink. Passing the puck between teammates works only a quarter of the time. Usually, your pass goes in a completely different direction than what you intend. One-on-ones with a goalie are downright impossible. You can try as hard as you want to fake out the goalie, but when you release the puck for a shot, it will go wide almost every time. Checking the opposing team works about 70% of the time. A lot of time when I go to check somebody, I pass right through them as if they were a ghost. It's a shame, because this could have been a really great game. Hey, 
Exile Wicked Phenomenon is a sequel to the runaway smash hit Exile which appeared on the Turbo CD and the Genesis. You've probably heard of it, it sold nearly 200 copies. That game wasn't frustrating, Joe. It was actually kind of easy. Yes, indeed. Anyway, this game is also on the TurboGrafx CD-ROM. It starts out fairly promising with some cool cutscenes and some decent music. It has some overhead RPG-like segments where you can buy stuff and sell weapons and learn new clues and all that stuff. But one thing that immediately brings this game down several notches is how close your character walks to the edge of the screen in the action segments. Why is this deemed necessary? It makes the game far less enjoyable than it should be as you don't have time to react to enemies ahead of you. You can switch back and forth between a total of five different characters via a menu. This is both cool and annoying at the same time, but usually you can stick with just Saddler. The potions that you use will also randomly become weird and cause damage instead of restoring your life. And when Working Designs brought it over to the US, they accidentally made the game too hard. Accident my ass? There are a bunch of sadists over there at Working Designs. Well, actually, they didn't have their own programmers at the time, so they kept making requests for changes that the original developers would then implement. They were allowed only so many changes, and the final change nearly broke the game. I'm not sure why they were messing around with a perfectly fine game to begin with. I mean, it's cool that they added a bit of parallax scrolling, but why mess with the gameplay so much? The game can be beaten, but damn is it tough in spots. This is unreal. Of course, most people who have been able to beat it say things like, It's not that hard, you just need to keep trying. Yeah, right. I admire your perseverance, but don't tell me the game isn't hard and super cheap, because it is. Otherwise, it's actually a fun game. Also, this game has one of the cheesiest box covers ever. Who thought this one up? And lastly, the game save takes up a huge portion of your backup RAM for no reason whatsoever. Nearly 60% of your space must be dedicated to Exile 2 alone. What the hell? Here is Battletoads on the NES, another fantastic game. So Dave, do you think the Battletoads characters were all inspired by the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Ooh, beats the shit out of me, I just like this game. Okay, okay, I, I was just wondering. I really do enjoy playing this beat-em-up. The game is great fun to play and has some really nice graphics and a great soundtrack. The control over your toad is really good also. So why is this game frustrating? Because no stores that I call ever have it? I'm sorry Joe, but that's wrong. It's because it's an NES game and developers love to make frustratingly hard games on the NES. Take for example the end of stage 3 where you're flying a hovercraft and you have to dodge walls and jump over these walls and also fly off jumps. It's simple memorization for the most part until the end when all you see is an exclamation point. Trying to bounce off the islands is frustrating as hell. Plus the fact that the game has limited continues to add to the difficulty. Anyways, it's still a very fun game and I partially blame it for my baldness. Dave, really, you might want to stop playing that one as soon as possible. Joe, don't start playing this one. Star Wars Arcade was a launch game for the 32X. Hopes were high and deadlines were tight for this game. It was based on an arcade game that I never got to play. It starts out pretty much the way any Star Wars game would and then soon you're flying around in your X-Wing. It's pure arcade action as you fly around destroying the enemy. Is this good as Rogue Leader on the GameCube? Oh, hell no. That's right, this game pounds you and it makes it really tough to get anywhere. You start out by flying around space trying to shoot down about a trillion TIE fighters. Wipe out enemy fighters. Why does every Star Wars game think it's fun to fly around and shoot down enemies you can't even see in a dark black background? Well duh Joe, you're supposed to be using the force. It's your friend. Well not in this game it isn't. The game responds too slowly and finding the ties is extremely annoying. You also have a very short time limit in which to do it all and it makes you feel like you're pretty much powerless. Just like the Rebellion. The game can even freeze on you for no reason. This is a broken, horribly unbalanced game. It's too bad because I think it could have been a completely awesome game if someone actually played it before they released it. The graphics are actually fairly decent for a rushed launch game, but the music sounds extremely unimpressive, like a primitive computer MIDI file or something. Rayman for the PlayStation 1 is at last another great game. I really like this game and it's probably the best looking hand-drawn game on the system. 
Very colorful and beautiful graphics makes it hard not to like this game. The music is really good as well, though the tracks are crazy short. Like real short. Rayman gains new abilities as the game progresses, which helps make the game that much more enjoyable. As you might have guessed by now, the game is frustrating because it's unbelievably hard. That truly is an understatement. The platforming is ridiculous in some areas, to the point where you want to break your controller and throw this game disc through the wall like a throwing star. I'm really curious as to how many people have bought multiple copies of this game or any other game that we've talked about because they've broken them in frustration. I have this game for the Saturn and that's just as tough, but at least I can use a Saturn controller. But as you can see here, it looks pretty much identical to the PlayStation version. Man, Joe, those were some frustrating games. I mean, God, they make me feel so, so frustrated, damn it. You know what's even more frustrated than any of those games, Dave? What? The fact that we only do two episodes per month, and now that everyone's arrived at the end of this episode, they're gonna have to wait another two weeks to see anything new from us. It says you. Why don't you ask my wife and kid? They actually have recognized me in the past few weeks. So oh, really? Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> but it, it also gives me time to see all those mistresses I've been wanting to <laughs> see too. Yeah, so. yeah. Anyway, uh, let us know what games you personally find frustrating in the comments below, and if you're feeling really ambitious, maybe even a video response. And remember, even though the game is frustrating to you, it doesn't mean that you actually suck at playing that game. Well, mm -hmm. or maybe it does, I don't know. Maybe. Anyway, we'll see you next time. So I've been looking at your collection, Joey. You've got awesome games but they're frustrating they're just gonna drive you insane what? if you keep playing them i mean look like this game panorama cotton that's this, not frustrating oh my god it's frustrating look don't, at look at what happened to me i'm uh, saving you you don't want to be bald do you i mean in games like this lunar 2 this that, is that is ridiculous. not frustrating it, it is horrible and the snatcher and um wait do you have a bag i'm gonna need a bag to put these in because the i gotta take them home so what? and you just get them out of your place i mean they're driving you insane and this game, like this Panzer Dragon that Saga. That is not frustrating. What the hell? <laughs> it, 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 trust me, it's frustrating. No, my, yeah, yeah. What the hell, and man? Dragon Force and... Well, that actually is kind of frustrating. Well, yeah. So do you have that bag yet?